so before I hand over the mic to Rahul, I'm, I want to give you a bit of a formal introduction. You've got it in front of your, uh, in, on the page, but uh, I've known Rahul for many, many years, and the first time I got to know him, I think, was because of his involvement with the United Way of Greater Toronto and uh, the golf tournament. Uh, that Rahul was organizing, and I think has continued to organize in aid of the United Way. So this was so many years ago, and I've known him primarily not as a lawyer, which is uh, what he trained to do, but in all his other um, uh, personalities as a member of the United, as a board member of the United Way, a board member of the Stratford Festival of Canada, the CEO of the York Region United Way, and now, of course, as the CEO of an incredibly important institution in Toronto, the Toronto Community Foundation. Rahul, as you can then see from his brief bio that we've given you, uh, is a man of many lives. Uh, and it's always interesting to see what his next move will be. Although, I hope, Rahul, it's a little early uh, to speak about your next move now because you've just arrived at the TCF. Um, so, I, I just want to stress again that uh, people do this out of the goodness of their heart. And I, I know, I do a lot of public speaking, and I know that it does require a lot of your time and a lot of preparation to do a speech or comment for 20 minutes. So for this, I'm going to express my appreciation in advance of travel. I'm here to talk about something that I find pretty near and dear to my heart, and that is about building a network. And let me set a little bit of context uh, for this in the first place. The first question is, why even bother building a network in the first place? We hear about it all the time. But I think in terms of how you move ahead and develop something, uh, you're going to see a thread of, of my talk today that's going to talk about do the thinking and the planning in advance. But one of the pieces of that thinking and planning are figure out why you want to really build a network. I'm going to leave two quick ideas for you. I think from a personal development standpoint, it's absolutely critical uh, for yourself to actually develop a network, not to necessarily like-minded people. People who think like you are only helpful so far. But to actually get around people who don't think like you so you can actually share uh, their knowledge and a bit of your knowledge as well. Then there's also probably the more important part, at least in the long term, and that is about the organizational development. All of you are part of organizations. All of your organizations, whether you know it or not, have missions. And in order for you to fulfill that mission and play your part as an individual, you really do need to build groups and collaborate with other individuals. So when you think about networking, forget about the cocktail parties, forget about the schmoozing. It's really about building your own capacity for your own personal development and for collaborations for your own um, organizational development. So we've taken it up to a high level, but I think what you'll get a sense of today is that it's a very intensely personal experience. So my five good ideas really revolve around yourself on a personal journey about developing a network, and it's going to be one person at a time, typically. But I want to start off with a big picture story that happened not too long ago. Um, and it goes a little like this. When I joined the Toronto Community Foundation, one of my first roles was to go to San Francisco on this big conference that we had down there. Part of the conference was a bunch of presidents and CEOs to get together, do a little networking and to talk about big issues that relate to foundations in general. Well, lo and behold, I found myself with one of only, well, the only Canadian at the table of a bunch of Americans. And we started talking about collaboration. And then the, the backdrop to that was we wanted to talk about the roles that community foundations can play in developing community leadership. We all recognized that collaboration was a critical component to all of this. So the discussion went on a little bit, and I sort of stopped it at one point. And I said to one of the gentlemen across the table from me, I said, gee, you know, let me tell you a little bit about how we do collaboration in Canada, or at least in Toronto. So first of all, collaboration in particular community leadership is, we think of being a community leader, not the only community leader, as they seem to do in the States. And the fellow looked at me straight through the eye and says, listen, son, where I come from, community leadership's a blood sport. <laughs> I said, how are you going to collaborate when the mentality you're going in on this is this is a blood sport, we're all supposed to be doing this together. Well listen, the, the lesson I took away from that too is this is how this fellow built his network. So rule number one, building a network is not a blood sport. So if you a smile on your face, there's a good way of doing it. So I think the first thing to think about before you start trying to build a network is to get a clear sense of when you start going out to talk to people and meet people, what is it that you're looking for? 
If you feel that you've ever been to a cocktail party and you're walking around trying to make small talk with a glass in your hand and it's not getting you anywhere, that you feel like you're at the end of the day feeling empty, ask yourself if you had at least a couple of ideas that you wanted to fulfill or follow up on in this course of this meeting. I think you'll find that very helpful. One of the other things that I heard along the way that I thought was a very good idea is uh, a First Nations individual once said to me, coming out of a meeting, he said, you know, you must be part Indian. I said, uh -huh, where's this going? And he said, because you, so there's an old First Nations thing that says, God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. I know many of you have heard that, but I think it's worth reinforcing. You're out there trying to build a network. It's all about creating a fit. Listen twice as much as you speak. And the worst thing that you'll do is leave far more educated than when you went in. There seems to be an inclination on a lot of people to get as much information out on the table, do this massive brain dump, ask the other person to sift it through, and help them. Trust me, it doesn't work. The First Nations guy got a bang on right out of the, uh, right out of the block. Uh, in terms of still building on having a purpose of when you meet people, I think it's also very useful to know that it's okay to be persistent. It's okay to go back. If you think there's a fit, you've got a purpose to talk to someone, and you're talking in a general sense, but you want to get more uh, specific about it, it's okay to be persistent. You've heard that old saying, two wrongs don't make a right. Well, two no's can make a yes if you know how to do it properly. It's okay to go back to people who you're developing a relationship in a general sense. You could get a number of no's along the way, but if you really believe there's a fit, which means there's value for that person and for you, be persistent. It's something that will be respected. At the end of the day, you probably will get a, a bit of a yes. So now I'll move on to uh, another one. So you, you've got clarity, you've got purpose, and, and now you need to meet people. So the second one is ask for permission. Uh, I'm going to contrast this just quickly with the cocktail party, shoes, fest. If you end up in that event, go and enjoy yourself. Have a nice time. Be a normal person. If you meet some other people, great. If you don't, don't worry about it too much. But if you really think there's a fit between you and your organization and another particular individual in their organization, I would strongly recommend you do not pick up the phone and make cold calls. You can get so far with that that there's a better way to do it. A little bit of a story to this. So the Maple Leafs are in the news again. Everything's going on with the Leafs. When I was a kid, the biggest thing that had to do with the Leafs was called pyramid power. I don't know if anybody's old enough to remember that. But they used to have these crazy pyramids they thought that had this wonderful energy with them, and they'd hang it over the Leafs' head hoping for a cup. But you know how well that worked. <laughs> but there was something out of all of that, and that was the triangle concept. So I want you to think about the triangle. When when you're looking at building a network. The straightest point, or the quickest way between two individuals, is not a straight line, but it is in fact a triangle. What I mean by that is, as you start to identify people that you want to meet, or do you think there's a fit, so first of all, there's got to be some sort of a fit. Try to figure out who you know that knows them. And there's nothing more powerful than having another individual call on your behalf to someone and say, I know so and so, you know me, I think it's worthwhile for 15 minutes of your time to meet each other. You will get very good response. So if you've got a clear purpose and a fit, and you've triangulated your call, you're starting to work, walk into the world of the art of connection. And I think that's a great opportunity to start building your network at a very tactical level. I want to throw a little bit of a story in there too. And once again, it goes back to the Olympic bid. Uh, it, it was all the art of triangulation and just about everything we had to do. We had to create uh, support amongst IOC members. So these are folks that would vote for the city who they thought would be best to host the games. We also had a list called the No Traction List. So my first day at the office, I walk in there and I get a folder thrown at me. It's called the No Traction List. So I have the same look that you do. What is this all about? Well. There are good lists and there are not so good lists. The no traction list is on the not so good side. This is a list of people that we had no connection or no traction with in the international community who we needed their vote and their support. So I got this list of people that we had to get votes from that I, of course, didn't know and nobody in our organization knew. So we had to figure out ways to connect with them. Well, I did the only thing I knew how to do, and that is I went into the connections and the people that I knew in this city and I started to build my way up. Until I find out that 
a fellow who owns a rug company up in Thornhill, is the brother of the sister-in-law of the Iranian IOC member. And that took me 90 days to figure out. But by the time I'm having lunch with this gentleman who's selling rugs, I'm also on the phone with the IOC member the next day. So it can be done. You've got to be a little persistent, but it's all about triangulation. I can guarantee you, had I picked up the phone in the first instance, I wouldn't have got anywhere in it. So real life example, I'm not making these up, they actually work. So you may want to take a little bit to heart. Treat everybody as a potential partner. Whether you're actually out there trying to nurture these relationships or not, it's absolutely critical. Your greatest asset in building your own personal network or your own network for your organization is your reputation. And treat it as such. It's what you're going to be leveraging as an asset and it's what you're also going to be building as you go forward. So when you're meeting people, they may not be a potential partner or a collaborator today, but they certainly could be in another day, or even more importantly, they could be somebody you could be working with to triangulate at some point too. And I'm not saying being Machiavellian and use people, I'm not saying that in any sense, people will see through that. But it's, it's remarkable to actually have to say this in the crowd, but for God's sake, be nice. And it's common sense, but it's remarkable how few people actually live that. It's very easy for people to forget that their reputation is their most important asset. I'm a big believer in karma, and uh, it's a great way to start to build some good karma for yourself. And it'll also enhance your reputation in quite a ways. Now, I want to put that in quotations, asterisks, exclamation marks, because if you're in a fundraising world at all, anybody here has to raise funds, this is absolutely critical. You've got to friend raise before you can fundraise. And you always have to remember that the people that you're around and you're talking with when you're representing your organization or yourself always could be a potential partner somewhere down the line. You never know where your money could come from. Of course, I've got a little anecdote for that as well. <laughs> this was a real eye-opener for me, and I still chuckle about it. Um, when I was United Way of York Region, we instituted a major individual giving program at that time. And our MIG program at that point was fairly modest in terms of what would make you a big prospect, then it was about $5,000 gift. Which is not insubstantial, but it's not a $50 million gift either. So I had uh, one of my persons uh, who was trying to connect with a particular prospect. One meeting got canceled, two meetings got canceled, three, four, five, I just kept on going on. But I said, don't worry about it. You know, as long as they tell you, as long as they don't tell you to stop calling, keep calling. There'll be a time it'll make it happen. So finally we got another call and she said, oh, I got a call. They want to have tea with me this morning. So in the middle of winter, gets all dressed, runs out to meet this lady, and has to meet her out at her uh, rural home. Gets there, and lo and behold, she wasn't there. She'd gone somewhere else. So what a down. So I get a phone call. And the phone call goes a little like this. I got there, but the prospect's not here. Okay, come on back. Well, I'm not sure. Why not? Well, there's a truck full of frozen turkeys parked out front. I said, okay, what's all that about? The guy wants me to help him unload these frozen turkeys. Should I do it or not? Sure, go ahead. Just don't report me to the human rights. But if you're inclined to want to do that, and this person was of the type, they were game to do something like that. So this individual spent about 45 minutes dressed in business outfit, helping unload a truck of frozen turkeys. The story doesn't end there. The $15,000 gift came yeah. out. Right? You know it had to happen. And even at that time, we knew, you know, if it happens, it happens, but don't worry about it. You're there. Do the right thing. We're out there to make friends first. So it's those little things, and in this case, I'm still smiling because it's hard to believe it actually happened, but it did. Uh, so bigger things can come out of it. Manage people's expectations. Keep your word. When I started out in my law career, a really bright partner who I still lunch with told me something pretty well my first day as a, as, a, as a student in this law firm. He said, look, if I ask you to do something, and you say you're going to do it, do it. Because if you don't, I'm going to remember. If you can't do it, tell me up front, I'll find somebody else who can do it, and I won't remember that you said no. The upshot being is, if you manage my expectations at the front end, you'll be fine and that's reputational, you'll have. But if you can't keep your word, that's the single thing everybody will remember. So once you start to get into that, keep that front and center. The corollary to that is, when people start wanting to collaborate and work together, there's a real desire to want to give more than they want to receive. You don't want to say no, but guess what? Sometimes you have to say no. 
And I think sometimes it's worth getting permission to say no, because sometimes it's the right thing to do, especially if you're not sure you can deliver. So if you're in an environment where ideas are being thrown around in the sort, and people look at you and say, great, you'd be great to do that. Well, okay, but you better make sure that you can do that if you accept that. If you can't, you've got a cogent reason for it. People will respect you all the more. It goes back to your reputation. So I think that's really important to remember. The last one that I'd like to chat about today, it's called the sandbox rule. And this goes back to, um, you may have heard before, everything you needed to know about living your life you were by age five, or getting in the sandbox. And there's a lot of truth to that. And there are two aspects of that that, that I want to talk about. And it's about sharing and saying thank you. Uh, very simple notions, but also very, very sublime. Uh, don't do it for the results, though. Do it because it's the right thing to do. You'd be surprised at how many people are not particularly good at saying thank you. Don't go overboard. A simple thank you can do it. But trust me, it's a part of your reputation. It's important that you do so. It shows respect, and you'll get that same respect back uh, very often. The sharing part. <coughs> Collaborations are all about sharing. It sounds like a really easy thing to do, but it's not always easy in practice. Because when people want to share things from you, so to speak, it may not always be the things that you are comfortable sharing. And that's a very sensitive dialogue to have. And I think it's very much at the heart of collaborations. If you look at it at an organizational level, you've got organizations that appreciate each other's assets in different ways. And sometimes they can ask for too much, and that can create problems. But when it comes on an individual level, I think you've got to be very sensitive to this thing. It's easy to share your ideas most of the time. It's easy to share specific knowledge or critical learnings. But how about when it's starting to start sharing contacts that you've developed over a long time too? People can get a little uncomfortable, maybe crossing further than you want to. It's an important <coughs> thing to do is to share, but it's also a very important part of understanding how to build a network with individuals to understand where you are at the dance level when it comes to the sharing. Are you asking too much? You're not asking enough. Are you being asked enough or being asked for too much? You don't know either. That's a very sensitive part of the discussion, and I think it's one to be really sensitive about as you're building all of these things together. So the five issues that we sort of talked about are really getting some clarity in your own mind about why you want to be actually building a network, for what purpose, Start thinking about some of the tactics you want to do to ask permission to start creating the dialogues that will help you further it. Talk a little bit about how you protect and utilize your biggest asset, which is your own reputation, and about the importance of, of uh, keeping your own word. And then there's the one that you just can't go wrong on, and that is if you play the sandbox rule and you keep that front and center in your mind, that whole relationship of friend raising uh, makes life a whole lot easier. And I can say in my life that if you do these five things, you'll be well on your way to developing a type of network, or for that matter, multiple networks that will help you in your own personal and organizational advancement. And those are my five good ideas.